Professor Ryan Liss and myself, welcome to the fourth annual International Law and Global Justice Lecture organized by Western Law's Public and Private International Law Research Group. I'm Professor Valerie Osterveld, a professor of international law here at Western Law. And this year's lecture is titled, The Pivotal Role of Crimes Against Humanity Law in Atrocity Prevention, and will be delivered by Professor Leila Sadat. Professor Sadat is the James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. As well, she has served as the Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor since 2012. Professor Sadat is an internationally renowned scholar with more than 165 books, articles, and essays to her name. Her film, Never Again, Forging a Convention for Crimes Against Humanity, was a laureate of four film festivals. Professor Sadat is the director of the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, a project on which she will speak today. She received Washington University's Arthur Holly Compton Distinguished Faculty Award in recognition of her leadership on this, this initiative. She's the chairwoman of the International Law Association American Branch, and a member of the U.S. Council of Foreign on Foreign Relations and the American Law Institute. She holds law degrees from Columbia University, Tulane University, and the University of Paris Sorbonne, and an honorary doctorate from, the North, from Northwestern University. And she's a fellow at, at the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School. Welcome, Professor Sadat. But before I turn the floor over to you, I'd like to invite everyone to turn off your cameras because we're going to be recording this lecture. And I'll also invite you to put questions into the Q&A tab when they occur to you. Now I'll turn the floor over to Professor Sadat. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Valerie. And thank you, Ryan, for the invitation to be here and deliver this lecture. Um, I'm really sorry not to be there in person because I've never visited your university and I hope that that can happen at another occasion. But at least we have the opportunity to use Zoom and electronic media in order to be present together today. So Professor Ostervelt has asked me to focus on the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, not just from a technical sort of legal perspective, but also from a process perspective of how does this kind of thing get done? How do we get these um, sorts of treaties actually created? And you won't be surprised that they uh, are the result of driving uh, forces, uh, driving people, as well as uh, coincidences and luck and world events. So I'm going to talk both about why crimes against humanity are so important if we care about uh, atrocity crime prevention, which is a critical issue now thinking about the world today. And I'll talk a little bit about the Crimes Against Humanity initiative that I began in 2008 at Washington University School of Law and how we pushed forward from an academic civil society perspective, a draft text that then got picked up by the United Nations International Law Commission and is now pending in the Sixth Committee of the United Nations uh, in a resume session that's going to start in April. And uh, Professor Ostervelt will actually, uh, I think, not be coming to the first meeting, but to a second meeting on the second resume session uh, next week in March. So I'm going to endeavor to share my screen. We've all gotten good at that during the pandemic. And um, uh, is everybody seeing the screen? Just to make sure. Yes, looks Thank good. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I got a very strange uh, Western. Uh, okay, we're all good. So crimes against humanity are, and, and this is sort of, this. Is, I, I should start with our logo. So this is a logo that we had created by a graphic artist for the initiative. And as you can see, the individuals to the left are suffering. Uh, they might be in prison, they might be suffering different kinds of harm, and we're hoping to see that they transition from this um, uh, sort of situation of victimization into a, 
a situation of hope and peace. And then, of course, this is a classic uh, beating um, uh, swords into plowshares or swords into text. Crimes Against Humanity, sort of why Crimes Against Humanity? Why this focus? Um, crimes Against Humanity differ from the other core crimes that we see prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. They have different material elements. They protect different societal values. As I hope to show you today, they have a different and a pivotal role in atrocity crime prevention because they can take place in peacetime as well as wartime, and they can apply to state as well as non-state actors. So they're very broad in the ambit that they cover. They protect individuals essentially from massive human rights abuses, even if those individuals aren't part of a protected group, so they differ from genocide in that way. And even today, we still don't have a global treaty on crimes against humanity. We have one on war crimes and we have one on genocide. So the antecedents of crimes against humanity, where do we get this from? They include the Martin's Clause of the 1899 and 1907 Hague Conventions. And these were treaties that were really directed towards the laws and customs of war, but spoke in their preambles of the usages between civilized nations, the laws of humanity, and the requirements, or sometimes you'll, you'll see it uh, written, the dictates of the public conscience. And this just reminds reminds us that international law has a natural law origin. In this day of positivism, it's hard to remember that, but crimes against humanity really emerge during the 19th century as a sort of vague condemnation of slavery in the slave trade. They grow to uh, become sort of a categorization of the massacre of the Armenians uh, in the 20th century, and they're codified very generally in this preamble, but there's not really a positive law text until we get to the Nuremberg and Tokyo charters in 1945. And here you can see our first sort of modern international law formulation, which is murder, extermination, deportation, other inhumane acts committed against a civilian population, that's a critical element, before or during the war, or persecutions on certain grounds, political, racial, or religious, in connection or execution of other crimes, which were war crimes and crimes against peace, and whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country where perpetrated. So one of the things that emerges in the codification of crimes against humanity at Nuremberg is international law is asserting a prescriptive, that is a fundamental subject matter jurisdiction about creating this new crime adjudicating this new crime and enforcing this new crime and displacing national law to the contrary. That's pretty radical stuff. And that was what we sometimes call the Nuremberg Revolution. So what was the legacy of the International Military Tribunal's judgment at Nuremberg? Um, at Nuremberg, we thought of crimes against humanity as a state crime. It was the paradigmatic example, Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany attacking its own citizens, not just the citizens in other states. And remember, the reason they needed to say that the international law sort of displaced the national, the territorial law, was because everything the Nazis did under their own legal system was legal. They had completely legalized the Holocaust. And so we needed crimes against humanity to sort of pierce through that shield of state sovereignty and say, well, it may have been legal in your national system, but what you did is illegal under international law. At Nuremberg, we saw them described as widespread and systematic attacks, that they impaired the dignity of mankind. Now we would say humanity or humankind characterized by particular cruelty and dehumanization. So think of the Shoah, think of what you've seen in film, in movies, um, about how individuals are treated as almost less than 
than human. Um, they were linked to the other crimes. So essentially at Nuremberg, they were linked to the war, particularly persecution was linked to the other crimes. And we know that Nuremberg was a tribunal that only prosecuted Germans, right? It was limited to the Axis powers. There was no equality between uh, allies and Axis from that perspective. Um, but there was a fair trial on the law of the facts. Well, we saw um, after the Nuremberg Tribunal was created, the Cold War happened and we couldn't make much progress on crimes against humanity. When in the 1990s, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, we start to get more international criminal tribunals created, sort of along the lines of the Nuremberg Tribunal. They're created either by the Security Council or by other uh, vehicles such as the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which was a treaty between the United Nations and the country of Sierra Leone. Cambodia had its own tribunal and there were special panels in East Timor. And crimes against humanity figure prominently in the jurisprudence and in the statutes of all those tribunals. In 1996, the International Law Commission produced a draft code of crimes, and this is based on Nuremberg, and you can see very much sort of the same kinds of list, murder, extermination, torture, enslavement, um, but we add persecution with some additional grounds, and then there's this institutionalized discrimination, which essentially we now would call part of the apartheid convention, arbitrary deportation, imprisonment, forced disappearance, which have been a signature crime coming out of the Latin American experience in the 1970s. Finally, we see rape, enforced prostitution, and sexual violence incorporated into the definition and other inhumane acts that residual category maintains. So at the ICC, so in 1998, we get the establishment of the ICC based upon a different draft from the UN International Law Commission. And especially since I know there are many students here, I should talk a little bit about the International Law Commission or the ILC. It's a government, it, it, it's a, a body of experts elected by the General Assembly to serve as members of this entity called the International Law Commission, established established by the General Assembly um, to essentially assist the General Assembly with its task of the progressive development and codification of international law. So many important international treaties emerge from drafts drafted by this group. In our country, I try to explain to my students, this is sort of like the, they produce restatements of the law. They codify the law. They study the law. Sometimes they produce principles. Sometimes they produce draft articles that then states can turn into treaties. So the ICC starts as a draft with the International Law Commission. And when it's established, the International Law Commission, because it had its draft code of crimes and that was separate, the International Law Commission draft for the ICC didn't have a definition of crimes against humanity. So when states start working on the draft, they say, aha, we're gonna have one comprehensive treaty that's going to establish the court and contain the definitions of the crimes. So then they have to actually negotiate crimes against humanity. They have to do that uh, largely because there is no treaty. Uh, they had a genocide convention, they have Geneva conventions, but no crimes against humanity treaty. So at the ICC, um, we see that it is a permanent court and the preamble says it's determined to put an end to impunity and thus to contribute to prevention. So for a long time, both the ad hoc tribunals and the Nuremberg judgment and the ICC have as part of their mandates, if you like, not just punishment, but also prevention. We know from our domestic legal systems that punishment doesn't necessarily have a specific deterrence effect. But when we talk about prevention at the international level, we're not really speaking about specific deterrence. We're talking about prevention in a state way. And when the International Court of Justice talked about this, that a state said under the Genocide Convention, um, when there is a serious risk 
that genocide may occur, states have to take all possible measures consistent with international law to prevent that genocide. And so this duty of prevention is something that exists in international law, and it's a little different than a duty of deterrence, right, or than individual specific or general deterrence. And we can come back to that. Well, many of you know, I'm sure if you're students of Professor Liss or Professor Ostervelt, that the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court is adopted in 1998. It is the first uh, modern, right, uh, permanent court uh, ever to be adopted after some 75 years of hard work. And 120 nations voted in favor of the adoption, seven voted against, including my own country, the United States of America, which did sign the statute, but has never ratified. Uh, your country, Canada, is a party to the ICC. And in the ICC statute, you can see, can you see how the definitions get longer and longer and longer? And in the Q&A, you can ask, why is that? Why do we keep getting longer definitions? Well, sometimes it's because we've included more crimes, but sometimes we've put limits on the crimes because uh, there's a little concern that it could be too expansive. But here you can see in G, for example, a really expansive definition of the sex crimes involving sexual or gender-based violence. You can see H, persecution, how much broader persecution is. Um, it includes enforced disappearance of persons. That language about discrimination in the ILC 1996 code has become the crime of apartheid. Uh, and then other inhumane acts is retained. So you can see similarity to the Nuremberg definition and you can see expansion. Now we have definitions because the Nuremberg judgment was pretty laconic and the ad hoc tribunals had very small definitions as well. What is an attack against a civilian population? What do some of these new crimes mean? So I just put on the slide forced pregnancy. There are others. Uh, what is the crime of persecution? And in addition to the statute itself, the ICC uses elements of crimes to expand upon uh, the definitions in the Rome statute. And here is some really interesting research. At the ICC, and I, I did this research uh, and I published it in 2013, and I'm in the process of updating it, but it's pretty much stayed the same. At the ICC, because it's a court that operates in real time and in peacetime and against non-state actors as well as state officials, we saw about 30% of the situations at the ICC were crimes against humanity only situations. That is, crimes against humanity were the only charges that the prosecutor could bring. Why? If war hasn't broken out, there are no war crimes. If it doesn't rise to the level of genocide, there's no genocide. And so crimes against humanity can occur in peacetime committed by state or non-state actors earlier in what I call an atrocity cascade than some of the other crimes. And Syria is a paradigmatic case. Um, and I, we can talk a little bit about some of these things. What else do we know at the ICC? It says state or organizational policy, non-state actors, applies in peacetime, uh, no armed conflict requirement, et cetera. And this is what I call an atrocity cascade. It's a sort of a picture of how do these things happen? And if you care about prevention, where do you want to put your emphasis. Usually you'll start to see human rights violations. So think of Syria where protesters go out and they start dissenting and objecting to government policy. The government might then use tear gas on the pro prosecutor. Uh, protesters, excuse me, or act in some other way that kind of escalates it. Individuals might get imprisoned. There might be state torture involved or some other activity. Um, eventually, those human rights abuses become so widespread or systematic that they amount to an attack on the civilian population and can actually become crimes against humanity. If you're still in peacetime and here you have sort of a, a frontier, right? For war crimes, you have to have an armed conflict. 
if it's happening during peacetime, you have situations such as the Uyghur right now in uh, China, where or North Korea detention camps, where you see arguments about genocide taking place, but it's unclear. And that's certainly a case in which crimes against humanity have been uh, documented. Uh, whether it's an example of genocide is sort of a different question because genocide, you have to adduce a very high level of specific intent to destroy a specific group. So mostly you'll see in peacetime, this kind of degeneration of a situation from crimes against humanity, from human rights violations to crimes against humanity, armed conflict then breaks out and you have both sides now attacking each other. Think of Syria, right? The, the dissenters eventually form a rebel army and they attack the government and you have opposition forces and government forces. Uh, and then you have inside that conflict situation sort of pockets of genocide where ethnic groups may be getting exterminated, minority religions may come under attack. You have, um, there was a siege of Kobani at, at one point, which was a Kurdish area sort of on the border with Turkey where... Um, Forces were descending upon it and they were begging Turkey to allow Kurdish fighters to cross the border to save them. And Le Monde carried this amazing story, will uh, Kobani be the Srebrenica of, of Syria? And so that's what I mean about how you can have pockets of genocide happening then alongside the war crimes and the crimes against humanity. And I think we're seeing the same kind of thing in Ukraine today, aren't we? The same kind of allegation. So why isn't this enough? Yay, we have the Rome statute. We know that cases are going to be brought. We have this potential of prevention. The problem is that there's significant gaps because we don't ever, we never got the interstate treaty. We went right to the international level of, of direct enforcement, but we never had the indirect enforcement mechanism. And so I've put all these different gaps here. We can talk about those later, but I want to proceed now to some of the process and tell you where we are now so that we don't run out of time. Time, and I have plenty of time for your um, your questions. Now, uh, this is Professor Osterveld <laughs> right here. Um, she, we were both much younger, I guess, in 2009. And uh, I put together basically a project at my university. I had just taken over as director of the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute, which was founded by former Nuremberg prosecutor, uh, Whitney Harris. And I had taken over as director and I said, why don't we write this Crimes Against Humanity Treaty? It's never been done before. And I had had the opportunity to study with Sharif Vasuni. Sharif is uh, right here. I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry. Sharif is sort of the father of international criminal law. And Sharif had been pushing for an international criminal court way before it's fashionable in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when nobody could imagine such a thing could ever happen. And then in, in 1994, he wrote this little article about we need the specialized convention on crimes against humanity. We put that aside to negotiate the Rome Statute, but when I took over the Harris Institute, I said, Sharif, come on, let's write the treaty. And so I asked a few people to join me. This is Richard Goldstone, Bill Shabas, another great Canadian here, uh, Hans Corral, the former Undersecretary General of uh, um, the United Nations, and uh, Juan Mendez, former Special Rapporteur on Torture, and Christine Van Weingert, who at that time had just... Um, she was an ICTY judge and had just, I don't think she was at the ICC yet. Uh, she had uh, been an ad hoc judge for Belgium in uh, the Eurodia case and had written a very important opinion. And we collected a small group of uh, very prominent individuals and said, let's kind of brainstorm this idea. And to be honest, it, it was hard going. Um, so this is my steering committee here. And uh, it was a little hard going at that first meeting in April because nobody had ever done this before. Uh, we commissioned papers and we asked people to write about various issues that could relate to a crimes against humanity treaty. We assigned discussants to the papers. So we essentially ran it as an academic conference with a parallel track of a uh, possible drafting. And I knew that Sharif would have to lead this effort because Sharif had led efforts to draft the torture convention, the apartheid convention, and it actually chaired the drafting committee for the Rome statute uh, of the International Criminal Court. So we came 
came up, we circulated a draft, we debated the draft, we then had sort of what we called a technical advisory session to take on board the comments. We recirculated it. We had a meeting uh, in The Hague to do that where we could get additional individuals a meeting in Washington uh, to finalize sort of the both the academic part of the project and the treaty drafting part of it. And we, um, in May uh, 2010, uh, went up to Chicago and Sharif, uh, Larry Johnson, myself, and I want to say one other person, we sat there and, and again, kind of took on board all the comments. And um, I didn't go through, so I have lots of pictures of all the meetings, but I thought in the interest of time, I won't give you those. Um, but it was an extraordinary you know, adventure for me. We had about 250 people uh, comment on our draft, which we revised many times. We circulated it in French after the Hague meeting in summer 2009, so that individuals who were Francophone could comment as well as Anglophone. We got a lot of comments and we really tried to take on board a lot of um, input. We then produced a draft with commentaries and it's been published in a book called Forging a Convention for Crimes Against Humanity. This is some of the language. Um, this article one in our treaty would have explicitly mentioned the concept of state as well as individual criminal responsibility. The International Law Commission has taken that out. Um, but the International Law Commission actually followed pretty much all of our I, I know this is being recorded. They don't say they followed it, but they they might have drawn inspiration from, let's put it that way. Um, we adopted the Rome Statute definition for reasons that we can talk about in the Q&A. We built it on four pillars, normative foundations, what are the sociological harms, prevention, punishment. And we thought it was important to include capacity building. Um, we translated it into many different languages, and some countries like Portugal translated it, and Germany translated it for us. Um, and so it is now on our website, available in all those different languages. Well, Professor Sean Murphy of George Washington Law School uh, attended our meeting at the Brookings Institution. I invited all the Washington, D.C. international law specialists. And Professor Murphy then, as luck uh, would have it, was then elected as a member to the International Law Commission and made as his sort of signature project when he was campaigning for election said, I want to work on crimes against humanity. He was elected. And then he pitched the idea to his fellow commissioners. And at that time, I was still director. I just stepped down was it last? It was 14 years. It was enough. Uh, I direct the initiative, but not the Institute. We hosted a meeting for the commission in Geneva. And in Geneva, we pulled together a smaller group of experts. You can see a few of us, not as many women as should have been there or minorities, but uh, that's something we worked on as we went through and members of the UN International Law Commission. And they came together to essentially talk about a possible treaty. They then vote to move it uh, forward. That is onto their active agenda, their program of work, as opposed to a long-term agenda. And you can see that the ILC from 2013 to 2019 did a terrific job really building on the platform I think that we had created, uh, going through provisions, doing drafting, and coming up with a text. And in 2019, and I have a little graphic here, and I can share the slides with Professor um, Oosterveld and uh, Professor Liss, if you like. Um, this is sort of the process. There was a first reading, government's comment. There was a second reading, um, and then it issues. And this is the preamble of the International Law Commission's draft, which is now circulating in the United Nations. Um, they did change a couple things in the Article 7 definition of the Rome Statute, uh, some of which I think are slightly objectionable. On the good side, they deleted a very strange paragraph on gender. I think that's positive. Some states actually object to that because they liked the language. Um, this in connection with language, I think is problematic. This has bedeviled the crime of persecution uh, since its inception, and we can talk about that. It has 15 articles and an annex. Um, obligations not to commit. They retained our idea that there should be a specific obligation of prevention, that states would have requirements of criminalizing this under national law, cooperating with each other. They can't apply statutes of limitations to it. 
superior orders wouldn't apply very much the Nuremberg paradigm, but in an interstate horizontal dimension, which is a little different. And you can see it would provide for universal jurisdiction in the case that somebody is found on the territory of a state if they are uh, suspected of crimes against humanity. And these are the uh, and it would provide jurisdiction to the ICJ. And that's going to be an interesting treaty drafting question. Will that be mandatory? Will it be optional? Will it be an opt-in or an opt-out? We made it mandatory. The commission has um, made it into an opt-out based on some research that our initiative actually provided to the commission. Said, so please don't do an opt-in because states will never do it. At least do an opt-out. Uh, there are a lot of open issues here, and uh, the draft, as I said, is pending before the United Nations Sixth Committee. So it was receiving positive attention. And here, if you can, every year I code the responses of states when it's submitted. And this is all publicly available on the Harris Institute website. You can see that the at the very early outset, there was some negativity, right? You had a, a significant number of states sort of neutral about it. Um, and about 20 states were negative. Um, now, these are of states speaking, right? Not all states speak. So you have to figure out what am I doing with states that are silent. Um, on the positivity, very positive, but not so many state submissions, about 35 in 2018. I won't go through all of this, but in 2019, what was so disappointing is Austria, so the Sixth Committee takes up the report of the International Law Commission in New York in the fall. And in fall of 2019, Austria made a beautiful statement about how important this work was, how supportive it was, and how it would like to host a diplomatic convention for the negotiation of this new treaty. And Unbeknownst to me, I learned something about UN procedure. The Sixth Committee, unlike the other committees of the General Assembly and the General Assembly itself, works by consensus. That means that even one naysayer, if powerful enough, can stop the Sixth Committee from moving forward. So the Sixth Committee, you have all this positivity in 2019, but the naysayers, Russia and China in particular, say, oh, not so fast. We need more time to study. And here you can see in 2019, we have about 14 states that have spoken. But the three opposing states, that's enough to kill the process. That's enough to stop the convening of a diplomatic conference. So they roll it over to 2020. Well, what happens in 2020? Oops, the pandemic. You can see very few states, the working methods of the General Assembly. They were in person, but for very short sessions, civil society couldn't get into the building. It was very difficult to make any progress. And so in 2020, we got the same sort of technical rollover that we got in 2019. Again, but this time with a protest from Mexico and 13 other states saying this is not acceptable. You can see that they we believe this qualification is erroneous. Uh, we need to have a deeper and substantive negotiation on the topic. And next year, we need to revisit the agenda item with a constructive and flexible approach, et cetera, et cetera. So 2021, we were super enthusiastic, ready to go. Um, I couldn't go to the UN because, again, civil society couldn't get in because it was the tail end of the pandemic. This time, many, many, many states chimed in. Uh, nearly 90 countries. Oh, that's actually old. I'm not still tallying. It's published. <laughs> and several options emerged, but the Russia results were disappointing. In fact, Russia and China essentially blocked it from going forward. You had 86 um, uh, states and entities commenting, 72 were positive, four were neutral, and you had 10 opposing, and they just couldn't even get it into a committee, right? We weren't trying to get the treaty approved. We were trying to get a committee created to discuss the treaty being approved. So in 2022, I was a little worried that this might happen. And fortunately, everybody knows what this is, right? Okay. In 2022, um, 
Meanwhile, in, in, the, in the spring of 2022, along with a couple of my colleagues, we started working with states and civil society to say we can't have a repeat of this. And so we actually, I produced a white paper along with the Global Justice Center, um, and I have uh, I presented it to the um, group of friends of the rule of law in the summer, and we presented them with options. One is the Sixth Committee could vote. Nothing prevents the Sixth Committee from actually just taking a vote. It's a tradition, not a rule, and it's a tradition at odds with all the other committees of the United Nations and the General Assembly itself. As you know, the GA votes regularly. Um, consensus, of course, is better if you can reach consensus, but it shouldn't be tantamount to a veto. And so our argument was Russia and China in particular were basically sort of importing the veto in the Security Council into the General Assembly by using this consensus process. And so what happened was, and I'm sorry, that's out of date because the, the oh no, that's correct. So eventually we got a resolution and the way we got it is they still didn't want to press for a vote, but Mexico and the Gambia, along with several other cross-regional countries, deposited a draft resolution prior to the meetings taking place. And so they preempted the discussion by tabling their own document, which called for the creation of an ad hoc committee to have a structured and inclusive process to discuss the draft text with a view towards negotiating a treaty. And uh, that was very positive. As you can see, 100 states this time spoke. Um, only four, uh, four additional were neutral. 100 were positive, four were neutral. And this time, 15 were negative because the stakes were higher, I think. It was the classic um, group. It was Russia and Belarus. It was China. Uh, Iran has been negative all the way along. India has been a disappointing uh, negative vote. But the states supporting large numbers of African states, decent number of states from Asia Pacific. Um, this time we got a whole bunch of Pacific islands. A lot of states just haven't been following this process closely enough to really be able to um, to opine. And so one of the things that made a big difference between 2020, 21, 22, wasn't just that sort of spines were stiffened um, on the part of states really wanting to go forward. They felt they'd been patient. The draft text had been out there since 2019. States had had plenty of time to look at it. Um, but also the fact that civil society could finally get in the building and Human Rights Watch, Global Justice, Amnesty International started making phone calls like, do you know about this happening? What's going on? Uh, and I think, honestly, the Ukraine conflict has something to do with it as well, because there is a sense that we have to hold the line uh, with respect to atrocity crimes and even reinforce our capacity to address them. So I think I'll stop there. That is where we are now. Um, a decision is supposed to be taken in uh, October of 2024 with respect to this draft text. I'm very hopeful that I'm just looking for my um, green share so I can unshare. And uh, we are really, really hopeful that in 2024, we can um, move this treaty from the drawing board where it started in 2009 or even further back to the Nuremberg Charter and um, get a complete draft. So I think I'll stop there. That's a lot of information, Valerie. I hope I covered what you wanted. That was wonderful, Layla. Thank you so much and for bringing everyone up to date on the discussions around the Crimes Against Humanity Con Convention. So we have one question so far, it's in the chat. Um, others, please feel free to add in your questions to the Q&A, but I'll start off with the one question, which is from Nicole. She said, um, I have a question about the lack of early crimes against humanity negotiations slash discussions. Was the delay in creating crimes against humanity treaties before the 1990s due to countries not prioritizing it, or was it because the powerful states, U.S. and Russia, were specifically vetoing or avoiding it, perhaps to ensure they could leave open the opportunity to take more drastic measures during the Cold War? You know, that's a great question. And honestly, it would be a great PhD thesis, because you're sort of trying to find a negative. You know that Raphael Lemkin um, 
and it might be worth sort of interviewing Philippe Sands and others who are really familiar with the Louder Pact legacy. So, so just as I said, Bassiuni was very, very instrumental in, in the Rome statute, right? And in sparking the idea for this. Louder Pact was very instrumental, um, Hirsch Louder Pact in, in the UK and getting crimes against humanity put into the Nuremberg Charter. And Lemkin was sort of his counterpart on genocide. I would say that Lemkin was Lemkin, we know, right? We know his story. He was at the United Nations pushing for the adoption of a treaty on genocide. And he limited it because Lemkin had this idea that it was the extinction or the attempted extermination of groups that was the worst harm of harms. And he wanted a new treaty condemning that. And in the wake of the Holocaust, he was successful in doing that. And to, to, um, to the question, right? It also has a lot of limits in it that the great powers were careful to put there. So the number of groups are limited. It doesn't cover political groups. Um, it doesn't cover social groups. And the United States took 40 years to ratify it because of concerns it could apply to Jim Crow laws in the South or other things. Louder Pact, we don't see that same evidence. And it was the French that prosecuted crimes against humanity at Nuremberg. And I have to think one of the reasons that their legacy has never been as strong as Whitney Harris or Ben Ferenz is many of them died fairly young. So Donadieu de Vabre and some of the great French jurists just... Maybe if they had stayed with us longer, we would have seen this push for crimes against humanity. So we're almost looking for a negative to answer your question. Like, why didn't they go forward? Maybe just nobody thought about it. They were exhausted getting the genocide convention done. And then the Cold War breaks out. And they had handed it all to the International Law Commission. So by then, we also have this formal United Nations body that's now up and running. It issues in 1950 the Nuremberg Principles. Uh, they start working on the draft code of crimes and they start working on the draft ICC statute. And so it seems that the General Assembly has like transferred that all to the International Law Commission, which is a body that that takes it up then almost as I hate to say it, an academic exercise because of the Cold War. So that might be why we, we just don't see it. But it's a fabulous. I keep scratching my own head. And that's the only thing I can think of is because we didn't have a Lemkin, <laughs> you know, and by then it had transferred to the ILC and the ILC just it's not an activist organization. So it, it's a group of scholars and jurists and they do kind of the work that the General Assembly asks them to do. Yeah, well, now we have Leila Sadad and we have Sean Murphy <laughs> and we have others. So making up for lost time. And timing is everything, right? It just may not have been during the Cold War. It probably wasn't possible to even conceive of this. And we needed the negotiations at the Rome Statute. So we needed another great uh, Canadian, Philippe Kirsch, who successfully you know, chaired the diplomatic conference because drafting the Crimes Against Humanity text was tough. Yeah. So that's that's extremely interesting. We've got uh, a couple of questions, um, some of which draw on some of those those points. Um, so the next question we have up comes from Misha, um, and it asks: Have there been any techniques outside of law which have brought attention to these issues to drive the treaty forward? Um, so, for example, have there been social campaigns to bring awareness and show um, the delegates' public perceptions and and other sorts of of research or techniques that have gone hand in hand with just sort of the actual drafting process um, and the work within the committees to try to move the treaty forward. You know, that's, a, that's, a, so Misha, you're, you're, um, you're ahead of all of us. So, um, you know, I've studied other campaigns, right? So think about the landmines campaign, which comes from civil society. But you had a big group of civil society organizations already committed to a landmines ban before sort of the technocrats and the lawyers get involved. Does that make sense? So part of the problem with this treaty is explaining to people what crimes against humanity are. It's like been really hard <laughs> because it's a more complicated crime. I remember at our very first meeting at uh, 
Valerie was there. Diane Amon saying, if we could just have a simpler definition, like genocide, people get genocide. They get war crimes. When you try to explain to them what crimes against humanity are, it start, you start tripping. So um, I also think it's been states in state self-interest not to be too eager to be on this to the, the point of the first question. But the other thing in the landmines campaign, not only did you have civil society sort of precede the drafting and the technical part of the negotiations, but but the activists did things like show up and put out little, um, they threw little circles on the floor where the delegates were going to be discussing this so that the delegates really got the feeling of if I put my foot there, I'm going to, I'm going to blow myself up. Right. And um, it's why I did use a film actually. And I actually, if we have a few minutes at the end, I have the trailer for the film you can watch. And we collected victim victim testimony from all over the world, just to show that these were crimes that people all over the world were uh, enduring, that there was a huge need for the treaty because you were having, you know, sexual violence in the DRC, you were having disappearances in Colombia, you were having detention camps in North Korea, state and non-state actors committing these crimes on every continent uh, on the planet. And we still didn't have a treaty that that covered them. So for whatever reasons, Misha, it has been harder and civil society was a little slow coming on board. I think in part, there was a concern that this treaty could distract from the ICC. So you heard from some states early in my campaign to do this, that, hey, we've got to get the ICC up and running. It's not really the time for this. And then we heard from the ICC people, we've got to get the crime of aggression. And if you start working on crimes against humanity, you're going to mess up our aggression efforts. So now that the ICC has gone through the independent expert review, it seems to have a little bit the wind in its sails. Um, we're hoping that it can show its usefulness in the Ukraine situation. That's certainly been uh, the world is sort of waiting for that to see what the prosecutor will do there. So the ICC folks, I think, are a little, um, they're very supportive now of this, but it has taken quite a long time. And once the ICC and international justice people saw this as a positive, then civil society started trickling in. So my good friend, Ugo Relva, who's the Latin American legal director for Amnesty, Ugo and I were the only ones in Geneva from, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. It was just, you know, the two of us sitting there kind of watching and, you know, I publish it. And, and now I think we have Human Rights Watch really digging in on this. And Richard Dicker has been amazing. We have uh, women's organizations now digging in on this because they realize this is the first treaty that would be an interstate convention that covers sexual and gender-based violence, which is a big value added of this treaty. So I think now there's just a whole series of coincidences. But your point, Misha, is it's got to be more than the technocrats. There, You have to show the social value and the real need. Uh, so if you have ideas, write to me. <laughs> Thanks, Layla. We have another question from Kirsten. Would you be able to expand on the decision to employ an optional clause over a compulsory jurisdiction clause and why certain states are opposed to compulsory jurisdiction? Oh, yes. Um, there's a terrific article. So, so when the International Law Commission does its drafts, the ILC is an independent commission, right? They're not taking instructions from governments, the members of the ILC, but they're closer to governments than a group of academics and civil society people are because they do have to they have to win elections, right? They have to they have to do things that states want them to do in order to win elections and to get their product accepted. And states typically don't. Well, some states. I come from a state that hates compulsory jurisdiction, right? Some states like compulsory jurisdiction, but if you look at the uh, compulsory, the the optional clause at the ICJ, you have about seventy states, I think, have ratified the optional clause. They have Article 36-2 declarations before the International Court of Justice. So that's a good chunk of the world says, yeah, compulsory jurisdiction, that's good. But a lot of states want wiggle room. And there's an article, I want to say, I can't remember the year. It was I, I was very sad that the International Law Commission was kind of shying away from jurisdiction at the ICJ, because I think that's one of the most important elements, actually, of this treaty, because 
because in Bosnia versus Serbia, remember the ICJ couldn't adjudicate most of what had happened because it had jurisdiction only under the Genocide Convention. So we have to give the ICJ jurisdiction to help us, you know, really get this state responsibility and this prevention out there. So the ICJ, I think they were going to do it as an opt. The ILC, I think, was going towards an opt in. Professor Murphy, I have to, I'd have to go back and read that. There was a hesitancy, and I actually uh, gave them the article by Jean Galbraith. You can read it. And I want to say it was the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. I'm not sure, but it's basically on treaty design. And she had done an empirical study that showed if you give states an opt out, very few will take it. Some will take it. Like when they ratify the treaty, they'll say, we're actually opting out of the jurisdiction clause. Um, whereas if you give them an opt in, a lot of states won't opt in. So if you care about compulsory jurisdiction and you're trying to make states happy to give them a sense that they have a choice, that they're that it's not compulsory, you can give them a menu of options and you can give them an opt out. And that that's kind of consistent with what we know about human nature, right? Is if it if they have to actively opt out, they might be a little embarrassed to do it. Some states wouldn't, my state wouldn't be embarrassed to do it, but some states might. And and so they won't do it. And if you, or there might be pressure from civil society groups saying, hey, don't do that. You shouldn't be opting out of that. Um, but if they have to opt in, they just won't do it. It, it just, it's human nature. So it's a great question. And it's this terrific article on treaty design. And so I actually sent it to the members of the International Law Commission. And so at least they put the opt out in. Yeah, the other big issue will be reservations, whether the treaty permits reservations. The International Criminal Court statute does not permit reservations. The Paris Agreement doesn't permit um, reservations. I haven't looked at the BPNJ treaty to see whether it has a reservations provision, but that's going to be, I think, a very interesting negotiation once we get you know, into the committee to actually discuss this. And so that the resume session of the sixth committee uh, is going to be April 10th to the 15th. It's going to take place in about a month and a half. Great. Uh, I want to encourage all our attendees to, to ask questions to add to the Q&A if you have some, um, but I'll, I'll take this chance to ask a question of my own. Um, you mentioned in passing that the decision was made to embrace the Rome Statute definition of crimes against humanity. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a few words on why that was done, uh, if it was just done for sort of expediency and that you're starting from a platform of agreement, or if there was something else uh, that was driving that decision. And if you think that anything was left out um, or that you would, would have liked to see in there in the definition of the kind of core piece of the treaty in terms of how we define crimes against humanity. So, um, yes, that is a great question. So when we started in St. Louis, we commissioned papers on crimes against humanity. And many people have objections to many aspects of the Rome Statute, the policy element. Um, Sharif loves it. Many people don't like it. The ad hoc tribunals didn't use it. Um, the civilian population requirement. Why does it say civilian? That word is anachronistic. It should be population, meaning these are mass crimes, not individual crimes, but it shouldn't be limited. You know, imagine that the Khmer Rouge decides to purge the army of all intellectuals. It can't be that they are not the victim of a crime against humanity just because they wear a uniform. So there, there were many discussions in, in St. Louis um, on trying to amend the draft. The difficulty, as, as, as I said, was that folks that support the ICC, which remember we start in 2009, the ICC has a large number of ratifications. President Obama is in office. So fortunately we have sort of detente between the ICC and the United States, but there was the sense that the ICC was still a fragile and important in, international organization, that it was the center of the global justice system and that the ICC definition to, to depart from it would create confusion. It could subject states to conflicting obligations. Um, the fact that I was an American didn't go unnoticed and there were individuals um, 
even in 2014, 2015, 2016, saying, hey, you and Sean Murphy, two Americans, this is clearly an attack on the ICC, especially during the Trump administration. And I was like, me? Layla said that, like, seriously? But, you know, um, that was a perception that there were Americans driving this project, or at least there were a lot of Americans lurking around the edges of the project. And so there was a sense that the goal had to be to preserve the integrity of the Rome statute system as a system. And so there were really, Ryan, then there were two options. Take the ICC definition, you know, don't every comma, every colon, everything, right? Or just say crimes against humanity as defined under international law. Make the treaty sort of adjectival rather than substantive. And that way states that are Rome statute states could have that and states that weren't couldn't. And then we thought that's just not going to fly under the principle of legality. That could have maybe been an option, I don't know, in the 1920s in my country or 19th century. But these days you want to have a treaty that sets out what, what the crime is. Um, and plus you could you could harm the normative impact if you didn't define the crime. Um, so we said we have to define it. We, we didn't take the option of basically not defining it. And once you say you have to define it, Rome statute definition was negotiated by 165 countries, unlikely that we would do better. Um, so the new crimes like ecocide or uh, other kinds of harms are not going to be in there. I don't think. Now, states could decide differently, right? This is just our decision. The ILC copied our decision, except for their weird thing on persecution, which we can talk about. Um, states could go a different direction. I don't think they will. The United States doesn't like the Rome Statute definition. And at the same time, the United States never really objected to the definitions of crimes at Rome. It was all the jurisdictional stuff. So, yeah, great question. Thanks, Layla. We have some more questions have come in. Um, two questions. One is from an anonymous person and another is from Kiara. And it has to do with the Uyghurs in China. So I'm not sure if you'll have any thoughts on this, but um, both questions are sort of hearkening back to your, your mention in your lecture saying, so there's lots and lots of research on human rights violations. Um, not everyone comes to the conclusion about genocide, but what can we what can be done with respect to the uh, issue of crimes against humanity? Yeah. So the the thing about this treaty that it'll be interesting. There are two separate components. One is individual criminal responsibility. So when we talk about genocide in the context of individual criminal responsibility, rightly or wrongly, under the jurisprudence of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and we don't have a case yet at the ICC, we just have some pretrial chamber decisions, really. Um, under their jurisprudence, they have said, you must show the specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a racial, religious, ethnic, or a national group. And that specific intent requirement has been interpreted so strenuously at the Yugoslavia Tribunal that in the last big case we had on this, in the Mladic case, even with, you know, 100,000 people killed, clear evidence of a decision to push a group completely out of the territory by terrorizing them, killing lots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, three out of two members of the ICTY appeals chamber said not enough to show genocide. They can show crimes against humanity and there might be war crimes, but it wasn't enough in the Mladic case to show genocide. Now, there was a dissent. And I do have to wonder, the ICC is not bound to take the, the holdings of the ICTY. And I think the Ukraine situation presents some, and, and the Uyghur situation. Uyghur is not justiciable at the ICC, not at least the way we understand it now, because China is not a state party. Um, but Ukraine is. And the transfer of children uh, is a particularly, uh, it's a specific genocidal act in the treaty. And I wonder whether Ukraine might give us sort of another go at this intent requirement, because the ICC has its own standard, the mental element in Article 30, as well as the intent under uh, under the genocide convention. So when we think about state responsibility, in my view, it ought to be easier, we shouldn't have to show, so sorry, individual criminal responsibility, very hard to show genocide. 
easier to show crimes against humanity because you just have to show knowledge and purpose that the person did it with an awareness that they intended to do it, but not in the specific intent uh, and that they had an awareness of what they were doing. So the intent requirements are probably higher than they might be in national law at the ICC, but they're not as high as they are for the crime of genocide. Uh, so, so an individual criminal responsibility, that's why I think Kamala Harris recently came out with a determination that what's happening in Ukraine is crimes against humanity. She didn't use the genocide word. President Biden, and I think your Canadian prime minister a year ago did use the word genocide, right? And they walked that back because they're worried that they can't show it. But the reason we want to use the word genocide is because it's the only treaty we have right now. So it's the only way to get in court. So the Ukrainians are actually in court arguing not only that Russia is wrong for saying what, what they're doing is a genocide, but that what Russia is doing is genocidal in character. So with respect to the Uyghurs, what we can say on the interstate level is different than what we can say at sort of the individual criminal responsibility level. Um, and right now, unfortunately, we do not have a court with jurisdiction over that. So what we have essentially is pressure uh, of civil society on China to comply with its human rights obligations. Um, and I'm sorry not to give you a better answer. Is is a great answer, but unfortunately, a, a bad situation. Uh, yeah. So the, the next the next question we have um, coming up is also from an anonymous uh, participant who asks um, for someone interested in learning more uh, about crimes against humanity and the need for a treaty in particular. Um, what are the sort of must read articles or books out there? Um, and they note apart from from your own work, uh, which I, I take it they're already diving deep into um, to recommend that people get up on top of. Well, so there's a whole series on just security, which is one of the blogs uh, that I read pretty regularly. They have been fantastic about publishing stuff on the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, on the progress at the ILC. So you can certainly dive into the Just Security blog series to find out. And a lot of those link back to different articles. There was an entire issue of the Journal of International Criminal Justice, I think I get mixed up with the acronyms for the European journals, but it was on the 2017 draft of the IC, of the ILC, and it's an entire issue dedicated to that, and it's excellent. It's got, um, I have a piece, but lots of authors have a piece, and then if you really want to get into it, you can grab the footnotes and all of those things and read the sources that we cite, um, but I think that would be a, a, a great place to start. Yeah. Dip your toe in and then get a little bit deeper. And then if you want to go deep, go big. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have one more question. And I think it's a great way to kind of end and wrap all of this together because it's from one of the students in my capstone in international law class. And you know, we're focusing on the people and the processes and the structures of international law. So Nicole asks, what were some of the challenges with the initial negotiations in St. Louis, where it was primarily academics working together with a common goal? And then how did that experience compare with witnessing or being a part of negotiations among states? Mm. Oh, what a, what a great question. So academics are freer to express, and they like to express their views, right? And they like to distinguish their views from the views of other people, because that's like what we do. We read something, we critique it, we say, oh, I don't think that's right. Uh, you got that wrong, or I disagree. So academics are pretty expressive. I mean, at least in St. Louis, we brought together a pretty cordial group, I think. But nonetheless, people were were not, they didn't hold back in saying, I don't think that's a good idea, or I don't think this is gonna fly, that's not, um, that's not something um, that, that, that I like, right? So, so, so academics, it's a bit like herding cats, right? So getting a group of academics, so we didn't try to herd them. We just said, here are the papers, give us your comments on the papers, and then we would write reports that would sort of capture the discussion. That didn't mean the reports weren't organized in a fashion that might propel us towards a more constructive next meeting. Um, but academics, I, I tell you the commonality, academics and states want to be heard. 
That's like a key point is they want to be heard. They don't necessarily have to have their opinion taken on board, but they really want to know that somebody heard their opinion. So when I approach the academic meetings, I would see myself as sort of a scribe. This is what people said. And then we would try to frame it so that the next meeting we could kind of take up those issues. We could debate a little bit more. When we started going into uh, when the ILC took it up, we started doing regional meetings then. We did one in Lima, Peru. We did South Africa. We did uh, Singapore, Asia Pacific, and the Nuremberg Academy hosted one in Germany. Um, and that started to bring together, and we started to bring together the practitioners. What really helped is when you put concrete text in front of people, they could then debate text, not just ideas, but text. And so those preliminary meetings at the International Law Commissions and in, in regions, I think, were really important for, again, getting buy-in from different groups, getting different perspectives, producing a report so that people felt they were heard, translating it into their language so that, again, there was kind of this um, ability to comment and understand, that was very, very important. And it was important to be inclusive. When you get to states now, so now we're in the sixth committee, um, mostly states are much politer to each other in, in the sense of they speak in a very formulaic way. Um, they don't speak in the same kind of directness uh, as academics. They tend to, because they don't want to offend their collabor, you know, the, the legal advisor from Germany is going to say something, and then the legal advisor from Singapore is going to say something on crimes against humanity, and then they have to hop over to the next room and talk about the budget or the, the right days. They see each other a lot. And so they have developed very interesting ways of working together. We have seen a little bit of uh, when, as I said, Mexico and the Gambia, um, together with these other states, deposited, tabled their draft early this year. We did see a little flurry of um, sort of banging on the table from the Russian Federation and Belarus, I want to say maybe Venezuela, very direct sort of dismissive. This is an outrage. It's a violation of United Nations process. How dare you, et cetera. They wrote a letter to the Bureau of the Sixth Committee challenging what these states had done. And the Bureau said, hey, it's perfectly legal for states to table a resolution. Um, and then there were a lot of backdoor negotiations that I wasn't privy to, but we were getting reports on the negotiations. And what was very interesting at the end of the day is what we understand is the United States didn't want to vote and the UK didn't want to vote. They still wanted the consensus rule and China didn't want to vote. So they had that in common. China didn't want something called an ad hoc committee. And so they said, well, what if we just talk about an interactive and working formula? And, and they came up with this vague language. And so once they managed to get China on board with the United States, United Kingdom, France, you know, the, the big states and Mexico and, the, you know, the other states, then I think the Russian Federation was sort of isolated. And at that point, there was a consensus resolution that was actually adopted. So that's a big distinction is, is the interstate process is more delicate. Um, the public part of it is much more formal and polite. I think the private part is probably more direct, but as a, as a professor, I don't, I don't always see the private part. Um, I hear about it from my colleagues who tell me that sometimes it, it gets a little tense, but it's not academic, right? Because these are government positions. These are just like my state doesn't want this. And you can't necessarily say, oh, but this would be a great idea. Then no, they, they don't care about your great idea. So then you have to trade them something they want on some other negotiation. So it's a very different, it's much more of a horse trading. Like, well, if you give us crimes against humanity, we'll go with you on this one. Or it's because there are a lot of negotiations happening happening at the same time. So that's the other thing I've had to learn. It's not just about my process. It's about what's what's happening over in the third committee or the fifth committee or in the General Assembly or in UN Commission on Women. And so, so there's a much broader portfolio that you have to take into account. Um, so mostly I've, I've learned to be more discreet <laughs> and careful. That's great. And I think that that brings us to the end of our, our questions there. Uh, and so 
Um, I just wanted to take a moment to say our sincere thanks uh, for coming to speak with us today for such an enlightening lecture that really took us through both the substance of this debate about crimes against humanity and the story of the diplomacy behind it, how an idea really moves from kind of conception um, to actually now being up before from the ILC to the Sixth Committee to a possible treaty. Um, so it's really quite an amazing um, story to see this, this idea move through all the processes of international diplomacy um, in quite quite a direct way. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you for bringing us behind those closed doors uh, and on that journey with you uh, and for such an engaging and accessible talk for our students today. It really was our pleasure to have you here and I think really in the spirit of the International Law and Global Justice Lecture. Um, so, so thanks for joining us today. And thank you uh, to everyone out there for uh, spending some time with us and for your your great questions today. We really appreciate you uh, engaging. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really an honor and I hope to be on your campus sometime in the near future. <laughs> we look forward to having you here. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.